button. Alrighty, I'm going to now share my screen so you can see some slides. You should be seeing a blue screen. Can someone give me a thumbs up? Can you give me a thumbs up that you can see a blue screen? Yep, awesome. Lovely. I want to make sure you're not, I'm not sharing my emails with you. So, <laughs> all right, I'm just going to let in a few more of the participants. Um, all right, letting a few more people join in. A few more people joining us, which is awesome. Going to get my chat window open so I can see if you're asking any questions. It's a bit like driving a car, I say, doing this. It's like you've got to uh, manage two or three things at once. So bear with me as I navigate the space. I will check in with the chat periodically in case I lose anybody. Please ask uh, Lorraine, you can see it. That's awesome. Please keep popping things in the chat. Um, if you need me to go over something again, or if you've got a question so that I can try and catch it on the fly as we go. So we've got a lot to cover in the hour. I'm going to share with you some tips and tricks to be more assertive. And just reminding you that this is being recorded. This will be uh, people that weren't able to take watch today or join in today will be able to watch the recording, but all of you will get the recording as well. And you're more than welcome to share it with anyone that you think will get value. Now, even though we are meeting online, it's important for me to acknowledge the country that all of us are sitting on. I'm sitting on Aranda country and would like to acknowledge the traditional owners here, past, present and emerging. I know some of you are sitting on Larrakia country, so I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners there. And I also know that there's lots of people from other places and I'd like to acknowledge your traditional owners on the country where you are sitting today. I'd like to acknowledge any First Nations people that may be in the room with us today and uh, acknowledge your contribution in the training. So what we're going to cover today, there's quite a bit. We're going to look at the difference between aggressive, passive aggressive, passive and assertive language. And so there's little nuances between all of those. We're going to get really, really clear on what the differences are between all of those. When you're clear on that, it, it makes it easier to modify and adapt your language and to also feel more confident in how you're speaking to people. I'm going to share with you some tips and tricks of things that you can remember in the moment. Some, some of them are going to be more complex. Some of them are going to be really simple and easy to remember. So we're going to look at how you can start some of those really difficult questions conversations, um, how to start those difficult situations when you're going into them, what to say to judgmental people. This is one of my favourite. Uh, this is a really good one for family functions when you're getting together with that cranky old aunt that tells you what you should and shouldn't be doing. You're going to love this one. And how to say no. Sometimes saying no is really difficult. So we're going to look at some different ways that you can say no in a way that's still professional and emotionally intelligent. So quite a lot to cover today. Okay, so what I want to start with is talking to you about all of the things that impact upon you in your world. Now, every some people may say, well, I'm not a leader, but rest assured, there's always going to be someone looking to you for advice or direction. If you're a if you're a parent, then congratulations, you have entered the world of leadership. But if you're an auntie or an uncle, then you've also got people that are looking to you for advice and direction. There's always someone who will be looking to you to, for guidance. So the challenge with that is all the things that impact on that. And what I've found is that I'm talking to you today about confidence and communication. That's one of the, the, the puzzles in the piece. But Rest assured, if you haven't had enough sleep, then it's really hard. 
to be able to communicate. If you are feeling stressed or you can't bounce back in the moment, then it's going to be really, really tricky for you to be able to communicate and be assertive. So all of these things impact on your ability to be at your best. We're just focusing on communication today, but I just wanted to flag this with you that all of these things will can impact upon you. So let's have a look at what happens. This is, this is typically what I see for people if they feel they can't be assertive. When you're not able to be assertive in a situation, it can impact on so many different areas for you. So the top three are the most common. When people feel that they can't push back, when they're under pressure and they don't have the skills to be able to push back, for example, they're going to feel overwhelmed, overworked and over this. If people are being bullied or micromanaged or uh, harassed by other colleagues, for example, then that becomes an emotional roller coaster for people. It's all of these things. Assertiveness really can impact on all of these things. And consequently, if you don't get to speak up, if you don't feel that can, you can communicate your wants and needs in a way that's professional and emotionally intelligent, then you're not being true to yourself. And that can lead to you feeling like an imposter. You're letting people down. You're not, you're not leading by example. What kind of role model are you being for your friends, your children, your colleagues? And so we can feel like an imposter. We can also then feel negligent because if you can't speak up and push back and stand up for things that are important to you, you could make mistakes and then you become negligent. And certainly you feel off course. I like to say that it's like dancing to the beat of somebody else's drum. Someone's pulling your strings like you're a puppet and you don't get to feel like you're the captain of your own ship and you feel off course. So when you can strengthen your assertiveness skills, then it will put you in a better place. It'll move you away from all of these things. So what we want to feel don't we? We all want to feel valued. We want to feel respected in, in our workplace. And we don't want to, none of us want to get anybody offside. We don't want to um, disrupt situations, the peace, the status quo. But, you know, conflict can be a healthy thing if it's done in the right way. And I don't mean full-blown warfare. I mean, if we can disagree with things, if we can challenge ideas or raise concerns about things, that's using your assertiveness skills really, really well. And when you do that, then you can be solution-focused. If you can assert yourself and communicate really well, then you can demonstrate the ideas that you have about solving the problems around you. And it means that you will feel really motivated. You'll feel productive and on, on point and you'll be able to make strategic choices. The really important thing about utilising assertiveness skills is that you can deal with whatever comes your way. So if you were say yes to something and you're not sure about it, if you've got assertiveness skills, you'll know that if you've made the wrong choice, no matter what happens later on, you'll be able to deal with it because you've got those strong language skills. Those that don't have assertiveness skills tend to say no more often because they're scared of the consequence that can happen down the end. So if you can strengthen these communication skills, you'll be able to make more strategic choices and you'll become a trailblazer. That means people will come to you for advice, direction, ideas, feedback, thoughts and opinions because you're able to communicate with confidence and all of that obviously leads to certainty and confidence. So that's what we want to work towards when we're building your assertiveness language skills. And it's always, can I just say, it's always a process of learning and development. You never master it. Every situation requires different communication skills. And every time you're in a new environment, you have to be open, learning, receptive, trial and error. It's always a process of learning. So it's, I like to think of it as a bit of a pendulum 
when we look at pa the how passive, aggressive, assertive, um, passive aggressive, we're going to talk about that one in a moment. We're going to look at what all of those ones mean. Now, interestingly, everybody thinks that being assertive is the most important thing. And yes, you do need to have skills in that area. Now, the mistake that people make is that being assertive is about being overly confident. You can be assertive without being confident. It's about, remember this, it's about communicating your wants and your needs in a way that's professional and emotionally intelligent. And I'll probably say that a few times. It's about respecting yourself and respecting your own boundaries and limitations so that others will respect them as well. And I say that to my, especially when I'm guiding my teenagers, if you can't respect your own boundaries, how do you expect other people to? So that's fundamental to assertiveness. And we kind of get that. Now, passive is sometimes a position that people will adopt out of comfort. They will adopt this position because they don't want to make a fuss. They don't want to cause any kind of disruption. And uh, that's not always the place that we want to revert to. However, sometimes we do need to practice skills of being passive. Sometimes we do need to sit back and shut up. Sometimes there are, it's about the battles you choose to fight, right? Sometimes it's better not to speak up and allow other, another person to save face. So there are times when we do want to adopt a passive position. It's just knowing when is the right time to adopt that. So you would all agree there are, there are going to be those times where we do need to be quiet, sit back and let somebody else be stronger in that communication. It's about knowing which battles are worth fighting, basically. And aggressive, again, can be one of those default behaviours that people resort to. And so some people can be very aggressive. Some people can be very confrontational, argumentative. And that can be a behaviour that they resort to. Once again, there are some times when we do need to be aggressive. We do need to dominate a situation. Not all the time, but sometimes. So, for example, in a court of law, you might find that people are really aggressive with their argument. Or, for example, you might want to say to somebody, please don't touch me like that. It's inappropriate. Or step back. There's a fire. There are times when you want to bark orders and be really, really aggressive because there's uh, someone is really overstepping an inappropriate boundary or there is serious risk and danger. So in those moments, you have to adopt aggressive communication. But those ones are kind of rare. Most of the time, we want to be assertive. Now, I'm really interested to hear, interested to hear perhaps a few of you can pop in the chat what you think passive aggressive means. I'd love to hear it. So if a couple of people would love to warm up your fingers and type in the chat what you think passive aggressive means. I didn't know what it meant. I did not know what passive aggressive meant until I actually started doing some of this training. And then I started to learn about it a little bit more. And it's always interesting to hear what everybody thinks that passive aggressive means. Everyone has a different idea about it. So I'm keen to see what your thoughts are. I'm just going to have a sip of water while you're typing away. And hopefully everybody else has got water too. Now, it's not always, um, obviously there's aggression there. It's not always obvious. <laughs> I love that. A smiling assassin. Oh, I love that. Continuous nagging. My husband would agree with that one. Indi indirect expressive, expressed negative feelings. Oh, that's beautiful. That's really eloquent. I like that. An indirect message. The key there is indirect. I love that. What have we got? Nicole has said, maybe an example would be if you excluded someone from an activity and they said, oh, well, it would have been nice to have been invited. That's, 
Yes, sarcasm. Um, they, they're sort of saying what they want, but they're also having a dig. That is spot on. Someone else can say what it means. I'm sure they'll be listening listen to more than me. <laughs> yes. So it's where you, you're all doing really well. A classic example of passive aggressive behavior is sarcasm. Sarcasm is a telltale sign. It's basically a barb that's not sharp enough to sting, but it's still got a bit of bite. Mary says, sulking to get what you want. Yeah. So somebody is protesting. That's a really good example, Mary. Someone is protesting, but not actually saying what the problem is. Um, saying one thing and doing another. Yeah. Passive aggressive is quite dangerous behavior in a lot of ways because it can lead to really, it's particularly in the workplace, it can lead to serious allegations of harassment, um, bullying. Passive aggressive behavior is a telltale sign of some quite serious behaviors in the workplace. So intentionally excluding somebody is a great example of passive aggressive behavior. Again, that comes under the classification. If it's, if it's repeated behavior, that's bullying. Passive aggressive behavior is sarcasm. And sarcasm can be words, but it can also be body language. Like, for example, the rolling of the eyes, the titching, like, oh, my God, that kind of behavior and in tone and inflection is passive aggressive. People are telling you that they don't like your ideas, don't agree, they don't think that they're valuable, um, but they're not directly saying what they feel. We've got here, when someone's intentions are negative, but they disguise it with indirect confrontational language, toxic, yes. And another example of passive aggressive behavior is withholding important information that makes you look silly or sabotages the work that you're doing. Again, repeat this kind of behavior repeated is can be um, signs of bullying and harassment. Yes, Lorraine's got it. Withholding information with it, which affects productivity and workflow. Yes. So you can typically see in a work situation when people are passive aggressive, they will say, maybe they will say that they support you, but then they don't actually come and support you. Um, gaslighting is a classic form of passive aggressive behavior. Is everyone familiar with gaslighting? One of my favorite terms. So gaslighting, for those of you that aren't familiar with it, gaslighting is when you sabotage someone else and then blame them or criticize them when they're not coping or they're not dealing with what's going on. So for example, um, if my husband said to me, uh, you're not wearing that, are you? That's a passive aggressive statement, right? Oh, you're not wearing that, are you? And if I get really offended like what what's wrong with what I'm wearing don't you like what I'm wearing for example and then he says what I just asked you're not wearing that are you that so he's making out that I'm the one with the problem it's not him that's caused the problem in that scenario um, it actually comes from a movie that was made in the 40s or the 50s I think called Gaslight and the film was about in it was set in America I think it was in America where they had the old-fashioned lights in the house that were powered by gas and the in the film the husband is turning down the gas lights or turning them up or flickering them and so try intentionally trying to make his wife feel like she's lost her mind and he drives her mad and and she thinks she's going insane because the she's going oh my goodness the lights are really bright and it's hurting my head and he'd be saying there's nothing wrong with the lights what's wrong with you or oh I can't see the lights are really dim no they're fine what's wrong with you so that's where the term actually came from but it's used a lot that's another example of passive aggressive behavior. Gaslighting is another example. 
The challenging thing about passive aggressive behavior, and I spend a lot of time on this because it's just one of those typical ones that we see, is it's really difficult to pinpoint. So here's a tip. This is the first tip I'm going to give you for the day. If you find that someone is being passive aggressive with you, you've got to bring it to the surface. You've got to call them out. So you want to say things like, it sounds like you, you've got objection to these ideas. Can I be clear on what those are? Oh, it looks like you don't, I could see you rolling your eyes before. Is there something, is there some feedback you want to give me on that idea? Um, what makes you say that the presentation is not a good idea? Uh, so just basically any question you can ask to get their intention to the surface. Now, here's the other thing. We can all resort to passive aggressive behavior out of fear. Now, just watch your own language. Watch how often, how often you are sarcastic or you are not clear. You really want to tell somebody something, but you don't have the confidence to tell them. So you resort to passive aggressive behavior. You try and let somebody know you don't like it or, or other means because you don't have the confidence to say what you feel. Or you might resort to some sarcastic humour in a way to say something without truly saying it. It can come across sometimes passive aggressive behaviour can also come across as bitchiness as well. So we just want to be careful. Um, talking indirectly about somebody uh, gossiping, that is also can be regarded as passive aggressive behavior. So it's sneaky, undermining, sly, but be careful. Sometimes you don't realize that you're doing it yourself. So the goal is we don't want to, we certainly don't want to get down there. Watch ourselves for it. If somebody else is doing it, call it out. We want to aim to be assertive most of the time, but recognize there are times when we do need to be aggressive and there are also times when we do need to be passive. It's about knowing which one to adopt. But let's not try to go down there. Let's not lower ourselves down to that level. All righty. So the other thing, the next thing I'm going to share with you is what do we say to judgmental people? We've all had those people, haven't we? Um, Tamarza, you're sharing something with us. I'm really curious to, maybe you can just write in, uh, I hope I'm saying your name correctly. Um, perhaps you can just put in the chat what it is that you're sharing. What the, oh, that's the Gaslight film. Cool. Awesome. I love it. We'll have to check it out. Um, don't all rush off and go and look at that link though, but that's great. We can look at it more and understand what the passive aggressive stuff is. Okay, so what do we say to judgmental people? Now, here's the interesting thing about this is that when people make criticism of us, when people are judging us, we typically resort to two responses. So like the passive and the aggressive pendulum that I showed you, typically we resort to one of those. So we might go into a defense mode. Oh, no, there's a reason I did this. No, you're wrong. You, you're criticizing me for this or this or this. But actually, it's this, this or this. We go, we start defending ourselves or, or standing up for the criticism that someone's making. That's one approach. The other approach we go is the other way is passive, where we, where we might say, oh, you're so right. Oh, yes, I'm hopeless. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm really, really sorry. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. That's the passive response that we can take as well. So here's the thing. What we want to do is try and neutralize the situation. We don't want to stake a stand either way because it's just going to perpetuate more conflict and tension. So here's a tip of something you can try. It doesn't always work in every situation, but I love it. What you want to say to somebody is essentially you want to say thanks for sharing. So when someone is throwing criticism at you, you say, Oh, thanks. Thanks for sharing. Thanks for your ideas. Uh, it's along those lines because what you're saying is you're acknowledging what they've just said to you. You've heard them. You've taken on board what they've said, but you're not having to defend and you're not having to retreat. You're neutralizing the situation. You're just like, thanks for that. 
thanks, thanks for your thoughts So thanks for sharing. Can I say this one works really well in social media. Those keyboard warriors, they'll send you a message or they'll make some comment on something and telling you what you should or shouldn't be doing, very easy to do. And if you try and defend or retreat in that situation, you're just opening it up for them to keep going and keep feeding the criticism. That's just exhausting. So if you just say, thanks for sharing, they will go, hmm, no problem. They might keep going. You just keep saying, thanks for sharing. It's one of my favourite and it's really, really powerful and it's really easy to remember in the moment and it just stops really strong conflicts or tensions coming out of a conversation or for you coming away feeling really yuck from that communication. So give it a go. Of course, you don't want to be sarcastic, can I just say. You don't want to say, thanks for sharing. Thanks for that. You don't want to do that tone. You want to have a tone of authenticity and, and being genuine. Just acknowledge what that you've heard them and, and that you're hearing what they're saying. That's it. Okay, so here are three ways to start a difficult conversation. So if you're going into a difficult situation and you don't know how to start a difficult conversation, here are three different ways you can do it. So I'm going to show you a sophisticated way, a very sophisticated and professional method. I'm going to show you a very common one that is, you've probably heard of it, most people know about it. And I'm going to show you one that's dead easy, really easy to remember in the moment. Problem with the, the sophisticated one, it's really professional but hard to remember. If you can remember it in the moment, great. You may want to use it in written feedback or any of those kind of situations, but this one might be a little trickier to remember in the moment. This one is really popular, but it's not always effective. And I'm going to share with you why it is and isn't effective. And then this one is just really easy to remember in the moment. And so if you are if you are a shy person or really nervous, this last one is a really simple and easy one to do and just simple and puts you in a good position very quickly and easily. So if you're not feeling confident, this is a great one to use. All right, so let's get started with the sophisticated one. Basically, there's a formula here. We want to go through, if you can remember it, the CICIA formula. If you can remember this, that's great. But there's a few important elements that we don't want to skip in giving feedback to somebody or letting them know that we may not be happy with something they're doing. This is a really good one for performance management. If you're in a management position, a team leader, a supervisor, and you need to give some constructive or developmental feedback, this is a really, really good one to use because it's going to empower them to improve and you're being helpful. So basically how it works is firstly, you want to be specific. You want to tell them specifically what it was that, um, that didn't work for you, that's not helpful, that offended you or is not ideal. You then want to communicate what impact it had in the moment. They need to understand why it is that that's wrong. So, for example, if I just say to you, I don't like the way you speak to me, you'd say to me, when, what? What did I say? It's not helpful. I need to tell you specifically what you said and when you said it to me so that you know what it was. Otherwise, it's not helpful. And then you need to provide a solution. So no point telling people everything they did wrong and leaving it at that. You have to tell them specifically how it is that you want them to do things differently. What would be a better way? What's an alternative? What's the solution? And then it's important once again to tell them why, why that would be good, what impact that would have in the moment. And then this is really important for millennials or anyone younger to see the big picture. What's in it for them? What's the big advantage of them changing their communication, their behaviour or, or whatever it is that's happening? So I'm going to give you an example of how this works. This is a scenario that I could just kind of thought of. Let's say you've got a new junior team member who is part of your team. 
you might be a supervisor or a manager, and they're making comments and jokes that are not being well received. In particular, they're making jokes and comments about other people's um, age. So they're talking about their physical ailments, their grey hair, all of those kind of things. And some people are starting to get a bit tired of it and some are finding it offensive or off-putting. And you've just heard this junior person make another one of these jokes in the team meeting. And it's directed to a team member who is particularly sensitive. So to give you an example, what you might do is pull aside that team member and say something like, hey, you know that joke that you just made now about Maria needing wheelchair access? I that, So that's the specific, right? The, the impact is I felt uncomfortable with that joke and it's likely other people did too and Maria may have felt uncomfortable about it as well. We want to focus on being an inclusive workplace and not sharing, not showing bias or discrimination on gender, race, disability, et cetera. So that's, I'm talking about the impact in the moment. What's the solution? You're a funny guy, Mark. You're such a funny guy. And often your jokes and sense of humour can really lift the room. This one might have just missed the mark. Maybe avoid jokes, maybe avoid making jokes about people's age next time and just keep it really simple and light. So that's the solution that I'm giving, Mark. And the impact in the moment, that way you'll continue to keep the energy light because you've got such a good humour and your good humoured nature will be really welcomed in the team. That's, so that's the impact. The long-term advantage would be this way, you're not going to get anyone offside. You're not going to, no one's going to feel uncomfortable and you'll always be a valued and welcome member of the team. So hopefully that gives you an example of how that formula might work. If you can remember that in the moment, that's great. Uh, I think what's most important in this is being specific, giving solution. They're, they're the key things there. It's great if you can also tell them why, which is the impact and long-term advantage in, in those situations. <clears throat> okay. Now, if you've got any questions around this, um, so Nicole's just popped one. What would you do if Mark got defensive and said something like, I was just joking, not my fault someone got offended. People are too sensitive these days and you can't say anything. Yeah, that's a good one. Uh, so um, I would use, and it's not in this presentation, if it was me, um, I would use the feel, felt, found technique, which is what you use when it's a typical sales technique and uh, to handle objection. So you've made a request and someone's objecting to it. Yeah, it's no big deal. Yeah, people are too sensitive. I'd be saying, hey, Mark, look, I know how you feel. Um, that's the, the first feel. I can understand how you're feeling. I can understand why it might feel like that for you. And then there's the felt. There are others that have felt the same way as you, but what they've found is that it's it causes more conflict than, than, than it's worth. You know, sometimes you have to choose your battles. Try and use... Uh, examples of other people that have been in the same situation as him. The interesting thing, and this is another whole complex um, topic, Nicole, is around appropriate workplace behaviour. Everybody has the, the right to feel safe, to feel respected and feel comfortable. And what you interpret as respect could be different to me. What you find disrespectful could be different to me. And so we have to honour that. And that's kind of what I'd be saying to Mark as well. Hey, I get it. You find it funny, but some people won't. We've got to be more aware. We've got to be aware of that, that sometimes jokes just don't land. And we've got a responsibility to keep everybody feeling comfortable in the workplace. So hope that helps. That would be an approach that I might take. And hopefully Mark comes around and sees that. Otherwise, it yeah, could become an issue. I'm going to show you another. Um, thanks, God. God, that helped. Okay, I'm going to show you another example. This one is called the sandwich technique. I was introduced to this as the poo sandwich, right? It's the fluffy white bread 
the yucky, horrible, pooey stuff that you have to share and the fluffy white bread. Really common uh, communication style and methodology. Some of you may have heard of it before. It's also called, I don't like this term, it's called the KKK. But this one means kiss, kick, kiss, not the other KKK. And so it can come across as disingenuine. And especially if you try and make something up for the fluffy white bread comment uh, to try and fluff around the situation. Some people argue that some people just hear the good stuff. They don't hear the negative stuff in the middle and they hang on to that. So it doesn't always work and it doesn't work in every situation. However, this one's really easy to remember. That's why it's really popular and really common. Nine times out of 10, it works. For me, it's always worked. So the idea is that you start with something that's positive, uh, hit them with the thing that's not so positive, and then finish with something that's positive. Now, what I've learned to make this really work is to utilize empathy. So in the Mark situation, we, we want to be empathetic with him. So it's like what you said, Nicole. It's like, hey, Mark, I get it. I know you're, you're working really hard to build rapport with the, your team and fit in. You know, I get it. Sometimes people just don't get the jokes and, and maybe they are a little sensitive. Um, so we're showing empathy with 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 Mark, maybe not quite that language, but you get it. It's along those lines. And then we want to, then we want to hit him with the yucky stuff. You're, you're, um, we want to, so for example, we might be saying he's a really passionate and a positive guy, but the pooey stuff could be, I'm concerned that your regular jokes or your consistent jokes about people's age or physical ability are not landing, they're not hitting the mark, and you could be at risk of getting people offside. You could be at risk of offending people. Uh, is that what you want to do? Is it worth it? Do you think you could maybe pull back on some of these jokes? That's kind of the, the, the yucky stuff in the middle. And then to finish off, I could say you are so passionate, you're so hardworking, you've got a great sense of humour, um, you should really do stand-up comedy one day. We we love the bright vibe you bring to the team and your innovative, fresh ideas. Um, we don't want to do damage to the great work you've done to the relationships we've built with people so far. So you can see I'm trying to use a little bit of empathy with Mark. Like, I get you, Mark. I understand. I understand, mate. But here's some things we need to look out for. No, also, I wouldn't do what I just did and use the word but. I'd use the word and. <laughs> I understand, Mark. And maybe what we can do is this. But can be a little bit aggressive, whereas and is a little bit more assertive. So watch how many times you use that in your language as well. So you can try the, you can try the sandwich technique. That's one method you can remember in the moment. But if you're still feeling nervous, and oh, this one I love. This is dead easy. And if you just, oh, I've got to have this really, oh, this conversation and I don't know how to start this with someone and I'm really not looking forward to it. We've all had those, haven't we? Yeah, we've all had those kind of conversations we want to start and we want to come through as strong but we're feeling nervous. This is the really simple thing you can do. Just start your conversation with you know how. And the rest will just fall off your tongue. You'd be surprised how well this one works. When I've coached people, they've just found this has got them through. All they've had to do is remember to say this and, and everything else falls into place. And why this one works really well is it helps frame what you're about to talk about with somebody, especially if it's something di difficult and it is establishes clear context and so as soon as you ask this question you're establishing did they know so if I said hey you know that you know how you made that joke before about the wheelchair to Mark for example he might say no did I what joke so you it's a really good way to understand are they on the same page as you do they know what you're talking about were they aware of the situation so you can keep the conversation going with well you know how and you know how 
And asking questions is also a way of showing respect to the other person rather than being judgmental, um, cr offering criticism or those kind of things. It's a, a gentle way to enter into a conversation. So if you remember nothing else, this is a really simple and easy one to do. So if you can remember all of, all of you can remember that, can't you? Yeah, you know how? It's a really, really simple and easy one to remember. Alrighty, we're going to now look at how to say no. I love this saying, the power of your yes comes down to how well you can say no. It's the things that you say no to that make your yes so much stronger, right? It's when you know your own boundaries and limitations that other people will respect them. It's I like to think of this as kind of colouring in all the negatives so that the positive area becomes really strong and clear. When all of the no's, uh, when you're clear on everything that you're saying no to, what you say yes to is so strong. Now, for me in business, this is really important. It's very tempting to say yes to everything to generate income. But then my brand, my messaging, my unique offering gets faded and washed out. It's really important for me to be able to say to some offers, that's not my thing. That's not what I do. And being really good at the things that I say yes to, rather than being bad at everything, right? So we're going to look at some different ways that you can say no and still be professional. So this is subtle ways of being assertive. I think one of the most valuable uh, ways that we can say no is to show appreciation, especially if you're in a position of leadership. So if someone's come to you to ask for something, they may have been nervous about it. Um, say, hey, it could be even asking you out on a date, right? So you want to show your appreciation. Thank you for coming and asking me for that. I can see why you've asked me to do this. Thank you for including me. Basically showing your appreciation is showing respect to them for coming and asking you in the first place. And give an honest reason without emotion. You don't have to lie, just uh, give, give an honest response. And then that is a way that you can respectfully decline. So it could be, thank you for coming to ask me to do that work. I can see why you've asked me based on my experience and knowledge. Unfortunately, I've got, uh, I don't have capacity in my schedule to be able to do it. So I'm not going to be able to meet your request on this occasion, but please do come and ask me again. That could be a way that I could respectfully decline. I think it's really valuable to show your appreciation when someone, when you're saying no, when someone's asking you for something. But here are some other ways that you can say no, some simple ways. So it's not just saying no. This one is my favourite one. I'm at capacity. <laughs> Who does anyone say that one? I love it. It's like I'm at, thank you for coming to me. I'm actually at capacity at the moment. And it's a useful one to be able to communicate with other people that you're, 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 schedule is full, your task list is full, your calendar is full, whatever it is, I'm at capacity and it's respectful way of declining. Here's another one that I bet there's a lot of you, I know some of you and I know some of you, um, <laughs> Wayne said that gets overused as a way of avoiding work I find. Yes, that's another issue again and so that comes down to time management, Wayne. When somebody says, if you feel that it's getting overused, then, and if you're in a supervisory position or a team leader position, then I would be digging deeper if you feel it's being overused because clearly somebody's not managing their workload if they're constantly at capacity. Excellent point, though, Wayne. It's a really, really good point. Um, another one that is a really interesting one is that when you're the go-to person all the time. So to give you an example, you're the one person that knows how to unjam the photocopier and it's always you. Everybody always comes to you to unjam the photocopier. If you're a parent, you can rest assured your kids are going, oh, I don't know how to do it. Can you do it? So what you'd say to your kids is how about you go and have a go? When you get stuck, I'll come and help you. 
right? That's what you would say. So in the workplace, we're going to do the same thing. Um, it, why don't you have a go? And when you get stuck, I'll come and help you. Or another way, another thing that you can say is, is this something you could maybe do? Sometimes people are coming to you to ask you to do something because they don't have confidence in themselves or, or they're not confident with their ability. So this is a good way to just put that in check. The risk you have as a very efficient person is oh, it's just quicker if I do it. Try and resist that urge. Try and find a way for them to do some of the components and you just do one or two elements. So that could be a way that you can do it is to say, how about you come to me when you get stuck? Another one is how urgent is urgent? <laughs> right? If someone comes to you and says, can you do this? It's really, really urgent. I would be saying to people, look, if I can get this to you by the end of next week, is that going to work for you? Is that going to be okay? Um, so, or if, or how urgent is it? Like if they're coming to you and saying this is urgent, when do you need it by? Um, so why don't you put in, Jody, you still, you can't hear me. Can everybody else hear me? Yeah. Sorry, Giardi, I'm not sure why you're not hearing me there. Might say maybe your headphones have pulled out or something. Um, so if you can establish what the timelines are, how far you can push those times out, timelines out, what are the wiggle room, that can be a way of kind of saying no or not now. It's another way of being able to, to push back. And the last one is... I can do that, but it could mean I'll have to drop something else or I'm going to drop this. So this is when you are reportable. Um, uh, Lorraine was saying there was a glitch with sound, but it seems okay now. Okay, sorry about that. Not sure what might have been going on. If you can, if you can say to people that and be clear that if I'm doing this, it means I'm not going to do this. Something else has to get sacrificed. Really valuable when you're reporting to somebody else. Jodie, I'm not sure why you still can't hear. I'm so sorry. I wish I could offer you some direction. It seems that everybody else is able to hear. Yeah, so no one else is, is commenting that they can't hear. I'm so sorry. Um, but uh, maybe you can... Yeah, someone's saying, are your headphones plugged in? Maybe they've just pulled out. Oh, so coming back to this, yeah, if you can be clear to people of the things that, it, that you're going to have for sacrifice in order to help them. If anybody else, um, if anybody else has got any ideas of how they say no, I'd love to hear those in the chat. If you want to write down other ways that you like to say, say no, love to hear them and share, share them in the chat. I'm going to keep moving on, but please do. I'm going to come back to them in the chat just in the interest of time. I promised you that I would give you some resources that are going to help you with this, okay? Uh, so there will be a recording as well um, for those of you that are having, if you're having trouble, Jody, with the, the sound. Um, it, maybe you can come listen to the recording and come back to this spot. Okay, so get your pens ready, please, because I'm going to give you a whole range of different things that you can do. And this will be in the email afterwards, but um, here's some things that you can uh, do for free. There is a scorecard that you can do. So this will test how well you rate in your capacity to be assertive, how well you, uh, when you need, how strong or weak you are in terms of your capacity to be aggressive. You don't want to be too high, maybe. Um, and the same with passive. So it's a free, free scorecard. It'll ask you a series of questions and then give you a customised report. So you just go to assertive.scoreapp.com and you'll find the quiz. If you have any problems accessing it, let me know. It will also be in the email that I send out to you. Now, if you uh, have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. That's my mobile number. That is my personal mobile number. You can, if you want to, book in a strategy session with me. This is something I'm really passionate about. I need to get feedback from people and help people and assist them. Now, if you want to, um, if you want to have a strategy session with me, by all means, book in a call with me. Just send a text to me, and 
you can um, have a strategy session. Thanks, Nicole. She's just popped the link in there as well for the for the for the um, um there it is again. I just scrolled back by accident, but there's the link if anyone missed it for the assertiveness quiz. But it will be in the email that I will go out to you all afterwards. I just wanted to see someone had in here a great die had say no by saying I may be able to fit it in. However, due to my other priorities, I'm sure that I will not be able to do this well and give 100 percent Can you think of other ways to get this done? Nice die. I really like that. That's great. Yeah, I can do it, but it may not be to the standard that you need. That's a really, really good one. I like that. Um, perhaps it would be better who somebody who's got the capacity to do it to do it well. I like that. That's really good. Okay, some other things. As there's a lot of stuff that we could have expanded on, and um, and there's a lot more that we could go into. There are some workshops that I'm doing online. Now, these are half day workshops. We've got managing difficult conversations. So I'll ex expand on these more. Some of these I will cover again, but a lot, there'll be a lot more tools, tips and strategies for being able to manage some of those difficult conversations. And the other one is maintaining a loyal and motivated team. So if you're wanting to be able to be professional and assertive with your team and keep them motivated and stimulated, then this is another one that you might be interested in as well. Now, the um, normally, if I deliver these face-to-face, it'll be about $500. If you want to do these online, um, the early bird tickets that are available now are $109. Otherwise, the full price will be $150. You get a workbook and the workshop goes for half a day. Uh, and the lastly, there's also some, there are some also some self-directed work at your own pace online workshops that I'm always building on my website. So you can go and check those out uh, if you're interested in any of those. Otherwise, if you're wanting something really comprehensive, we're developing a 12-month program, Resilient Leader Program. So it's covering all of this stuff. We're doing self-directed learning and also uh, some coaching and workshops. Um, uh, so what have we got, Lorraine said, um, doing things like Barbara has described will be so much stressful in the long run. Yes. <laughs> um, so yes, if you're interested in the Resilient Leader Program and want some more information, please just reach out. Failing all that, you can find me on social media. I am always sharing tips and tricks and strategies and little tools that you can adopt. So you are more than welcome to connect with me on Facebook or LinkedIn um, or in the Facebook groups that I have where I'm sharing this information as well. So we've just oh, look, finished with five minutes to spare. So I did really, really well with the time. Um, so what have we got? It's not, it's no for now, but it's not no forever. Oh, that sounds like what you'd say if someone asked you on a date. That's so beautiful. <laughs> I love that one. Does anybody have, I'll leave this slide up for a little bit longer, but does anybody have any questions? You are more than welcome to open up your mic uh, and I'd be I'm ha happy to stay here as long as you like to answer any questions that you might have. Or if you want to open up your mic and share any tips that you have that have worked for you, I'd love to hear them. I'm always learning more from everyone every time I do this training. So feel free. Someone's opened their mic. Got a question? Yeah, I'm just interested to know what sort of motivates you. I know you're passionate about it, but I think that's probably some of the secret in how you can do it so successfully. What motivates you to have this mindset but you want to be helpful you want to be humble all of the above I think that's a great question and I like that you asked that for me personally the reason that I pursue this is uh, a, a, a constant desire to learn and improve when years ago my background was actually in performance and acting and I trained at a specialist performing arts school and one of the things that I learned there was that you can let your ego get in the way of your own development and that means that you can plateau so if you say I know all there is to know there's nothing else to learn then you're stuck at that level of competency 
and you never, they're like the Peter principle, right? You get promoted to your own level of incompetency. So what inspires me and motivates me is to constantly learn. And every cultural situation is different. And so there's a different yeah, I think, approach. Yeah, I, I, that, I understand. That, that resonates with me a little bit. I mean, I did martial arts for many years. And I remember my teacher saying, like, you know, everybody's got good and bad ego. Use your good ego. You know what I mean? So everybody's yeah. got their own personality type. But it's also kind of having an open mind helps you not have barriers and go I don't like that or I can't do that or I don't want to do that so yeah and martial arts is a great example um so I studied um tai chi and also I used to go to buddhist classes as well and in buddhism classes it was always about uh eternal suffering they used to talk about but always that there is a different point of view always always that you there could be a different approach a different story a different way of doing things another reason for the way things are and that's so exciting when you find that yeah i just think that um you know while we're trying to be as in, in a professional setting be as objective as we can be and less subjective because it's when you know people uh, don't respond well to that i just think that you know i we're, we're still people and you know we've still got to have creativity and we, we've got to be able to have those difficult conversations to um to be able to add value and sometimes that's not always agreeing with with you know the, the loudest voice in the room or the strongest opinion so yeah thanks very much that's sort of opened my mind a little bit more and it's sort of confirmed some of the behavior that i sort of or, or some of the tips and um or, or, or some of the ways that i approach things as well that's great yeah. i'd encourage you to there's a lot of talk at the moment around um psychological risk or psychological safety in the workplace and uh the idea is that the work we to reduce risk, to mitigate risk, is creating a space for safe conflict, which I find absolutely fascinating. So people, as I said in the beginning of the, the webinar, is people having capacity to speak up or question things or raise concern because it leads to innovation and, and less risk. So being having the right assertiveness language but also having a workplace that encourages it and and capacity is what we you know, what we want to aspire to. What did you call that psychological? Yeah, it's Safe Work Australia just put out a whole paper around as a recommendation for workplace health and safety plans. But it's psychological safety or psychological risk. If you if you Google those, there's a lot out there. But Safe Work Australia have also just put some stuff out as well. Yeah, I think there's um there's some like customer experience stuff in there as well. Yeah, yeah, definitely. All right, very good. Thank you very much. That was that was great. My pleasure. Any, anyone else have any other questions? Barbara, sorry, I just wanted to ask you if you could repeat your and but oh, example. Yes. Yes, it's a really interesting one. Uh you will be be less aggressive if you can try and use and in a, in a conversation rather than but so to give you an example this came up in just the one that comes to mind it came up in some training I did the other day where um, the finance manager would get people angry if they hadn't been paid what they expected in their pay in their pay that week um, so her what she wanted to say was um you haven't been uh, you haven't been paid what you should you're normally paid. But if you don't put your timesheet in, you or if you don't put in your uh, your sick leave, then you're not going to get paid. So how you would need to change that is yes, that's correct. You haven't been paid what you're normally paid, and if you don't put in your sick leave documents, then you won't get paid. You need to be able to put in your, your sick leave documents to get what you are expecting. See how softer it is than a but. Uh, so if you can try and use, I use it a lot when I'm coaching. So but can be very, um, it's butting up against them. It's confrontational, whereas and is kind of walking alongside them. So just listen out for your own language and see how often you, you but and go. So try yes and rather than yes but, <laughs> for example. I've, I've oh, sorry to interrupt there. I've also had somebody um, mention to me, and this this works in like when people have got 
competing ideas and stuff like that, we could go, well, well, that's a, and it's how you deliver it sometimes. Well, that's a way of doing it, but let's, um, let's, you know, take it to the floor and see if there's any other, can somebody think of anything better? Sorry, comes... so you were right on the money, but you used the word but. So um, that's one way of looking at it. So rather than saying, but let's take it to the floor, go, that's one way of looking at it. And let's and... take it to the floor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah you just got to remove that word from your vocabulary because it's just got negative connotations attached to it, regardless of what you say around that word. Yes, and I still do it. You heard me say it, but uh, but I'm uh, I, but uh, however I'm becoming <laughs> more consciously aware of it. I'm, I'm I'm mindful of myself doing it. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Anybody else? Yeah, lang language is very powerful. It can make a huge difference, huge, and just changing. It's so easy for people to misinterpret what you're saying. Uh, just changing those little nuances can make a world of difference. So managing difficult conversations, for example, we go a lot into different, a lot more techniques. So that sissia one will be in there, but also about how to do positive feedback as well. Um, so, yeah, there's little nuances that and changes you can make to your language that make a world of difference. Yeah, I, I think I'm actually interested in doing that course as well, because I'm just thinking the, the kind of work that I do, we go, we spread across departments and certain departments have their own vibe and you have to have that vocabulary yeah. for all the little niche, um, you know, cultures around the place. But, yeah, I just find that, yeah. You, and, and I've done other stuff as well through our people and capability office and it's to do with you know the, in a professional setting there's typically four personality types some dominating some you know some um, manager types they want less detail they just want the yes no can it be done and all that sort of stuff and yeah so I just find that wherever you go around the place there's the somebody fits into one of those categories and, and knowing what vocabulary vocabulary to use in what situation can really make a difference well there's a lot of people here from cdu so there's a lot of probably a lot of educators and so part of what you learn as an educator is different learning styles some people like to are very visual some people are auditory some people are kinesthetic so um, that's another thing again that that i cover in some of my training is understanding how you adapt your own preference. We all have our own preference of how we like to communicate and adapting to the people that you're working with. So yeah, it's very much about using the language and it, those personality traits. One of my favorite books is Personality Plus by Florence Lydia. And she also wrote Personality Plus at work. And it's very much about the language you use with those different personality types and looking out for those different personality types so you can uh, communicate with them in a way that they're, they're going to be comfortable with. Bigger, bigger topic again. Yeah, we use, uh, of course, we did have the DISC method. I can't remember what everything yeah, stands yeah. for. That's a classic one. But, yeah, so yeah. Personality Plus is almost identical to DISC. It's got yeah. the same. Most of these personality profiling tools break it down into four, eight or 16 type of traits. Most of them do, all of the ones that I've seen. But DISC is the most popular and common. Yeah. Yeah, because at the end, the end of the day, if, 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 if we all work better when we work together, not against each other. Yeah, of course. We're all, we're, all, we're all trying to achieve the same outcome. Yes, yeah. All right, I have to bow out now. Thanks, heaps. That's no problem. Anybody? Yet? You don't. You don't all have to stay on. But if you've got, I'm here to to stay and answer any questions that anyone else might have. Lovely comments and questions people have had. Thank you for all the thank yous in the chat. Thanks, everyone. All right, if there's no more questions or comments, um, I'm going to shut down. This will be sent out to you with a link to the recording in the next day or two and links to some of those things that I shared with you in the slides. So you'll all receive some emails as well for any other training and free webinars that I've got coming up. I'm always doing some. So thanks for hanging out with me during your lunch break and I look forward to catching up with you on the next one. Bye for now.